In this video, we're going to talk about some of the ways you might cache data in your Svelkit application. We're going to go through a couple of different scenarios, as well as implement Redis at the end so that you can see how that works with Svelkit as well. So let's get into it. Our example scenario is that we are building a movie app where users can search for movies and view a list of movies matching that search term. We're going to be using a third party protected API to get the movie data, which is protected with an API key. And then let's just pretend that this also has metered billing where we get charged per request to the API. So since this API requires an API key, we need to interact with it from our Svelkit server because we don't want to expose that API key to the client. So our Svelkit server is essentially going to be acting as a middleman in this scenario, just relaying the request back and forth. So when a user searches for Fight Club, the browser will make a GET request to the Svelkit server, and then our server will make a GET request to the third-party API with that same search term. And then that third-party API will return that data back to our server, which will then return it back to the browser. Now, most APIs that you consume will have some sort of cache control header, which specifies how long the data should be cached before it's considered stale. So the API that we're using today sets a max age of 600, which is 600 seconds or 10 minutes. And the problem is that if we're running our Svelkit server on something like Vercel, it is stateless, which means that it can't keep track of this cache control header. And by default, we're not passing that header along to our browser. So the first thing we can do to start implementing caching is to simply pass pass that cache control header onto our browser. So whatever we receive from this third-party API, we will set on our browser. So let's take a look at what that might actually look like. So this is what our example application looks like. We can search for movie, I can say hello, and we get a bunch of movies that get rendered out here in these little cards. And then if we actually look at the code, we can see that we're just using a single input with a form action going to slash search, which is gonna be a get request since we didn't specify a method. And then on our page.server, we will then get that search query from our URL object. If one doesn't exist, we're gonna throw an error and then we're gonna get the movie. So I have a couple console logs here just to demonstrate something. You can ignore this for now, but we're just making a fetch request to the movie DB, passing along our API key, as well as the query or the search term that was passed from our browser. And then if the response is not okay, we're gonna throw an error. Otherwise, we're just gonna return the movies. So if we come into our browser and we open up the network tab here, and we make sure that everybody can see this, and we search for something like avatar, we'll see that it took 458 milliseconds to resolve this request, right? Because we made a request to our server and then the request to the API. So if we come here and search for avatar again, and let me clear this out, we'll see that this time it only took 122 milliseconds, but we're still, it's still being fulfilled by the network, right? So if I come again and search it, we'll see that this time it took 409 milliseconds. So really nothing is being cached at this point in time. So let's implement that very basic level of caching. And we can do that by coming into our function here. And in order to determine what is actually set on this response as a cache control header, we can just console log the res.headers.get and then do cache control. And we'll see here that we get public and max age equals 600. So an easy way to just relay this onto the client is to simply say const cache control equals res.headers.get cache control. And then we need to actually take in set headers here and we can say if cache control, because this could possibly be null, right? Or undefined. If cache control, we want to say set headers and it's going to be an object and we'll say cache control is cache control. So let's just see what this looks like now. So if we go in here and we type in cats, we're going to see that it took us 462 milliseconds to get this data into right of this page. And then if we go back and we type in cats again, though, we'll see that it took one millisecond and we can see how fast that was. And it was fulfilled by the disk cache. So again, that will work for 10 minutes because that's how long the max age is set to. So if we set this cache control instead to something manual, like max age equals 10 for 10 seconds, we come back in here and we type in animal. Let's clear all this out. We're gonna see that we took 290 milliseconds, but if we come back really quick and do animal, it was fulfilled by the disk cache because we're still within that 10 second window. But if we wait a few more seconds here and search for animal, we'll see that now it was fulfilled by the network and it took the entirety of 146 milliseconds to fetch that data, okay? So we're gonna revert this back to cache control for the time being. And let's take a look at scenario number two. 
Since the first rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club, everyone must do their own research. So each of these users search for Fight Club at the exact same time or around about the same time. You could also throw the scenario that there's something going viral right now, some movie, and everybody's searching for it at the exact same time. Well, even with our caching strategy that we have set up right now, sure, each one of these browsers, if they make another request for the same movie within that 10 minute period, we won't issue another request to our API, but if 500 users all issue it back to back to back to back to back, we're still gonna make requests to our third-party API and still accrue billing costs there. And it's in scenarios like this where it makes sense to have something like a Redis cache set up. And before we actually get into setting up Redis, I wanna walk you through the process that we're gonna to use to cache this data and consume the data. So we can see here that the scenario three is a cache miss. And a cache miss is pretty self-explanatory. It's where the data wasn't in the cache. It was a miss, it was an air ball, whatever you wanna call it. So the browser makes a request to search for Fight Club. Our server first checks with the Redis cache to say, hey, can I have Fight Club? And Redis cache says, no, sorry, you missed. We don't have that in our cache. The, and then the server is like, okay, well, I need to go get it from my API. So it makes a request to the third-party API. The API responds with the data and the server will then store that in the cache with the expiration set to whatever this response cache control header was, right? And then it will return the data to the browser. So then the next request that comes through is going to be a cache hit where our browser makes that same request, another browser, right? Let's say another user makes the request for Fight Club. It's gonna check the cache. The cache does have that data. So it's going to return it back to the server. It's super quick by the way. And then we will return this back to the browser. If you notice here, we have TTL set. So what this TTL is here for is because let's just say on this cache miss, right? We're setting this to expire in 10 minutes. Well, let's just say that it takes nine minutes for this user to make this request. So there's only one more minute left before it's expired from our cache. And the server says that we should request more data because it could be stale. So if we set this to be 10 minutes, that means this browser here is gonna have data that is potentially stale for over nine minutes or is gonna have this data that's been there for 19 minutes total when we really should be refreshing it within the next minute or so. So we can actually get the TTL from Redis as well and say, hey, how long until this expires? And then pass that along in the cache control headers to the browser right here. So let's go ahead and set up Redis and start using it. And we can actually get a free instance of Redis to run in the cloud up to a certain point. They have a free tier, which is fantastic. You can start playing around with this or you can deploy it locally through a Docker container or something. But to keep things simple, we're just gonna be using the cloud instance that they offer. So you wanna come to app.redislabs.com. We're gonna click on sign up and you'll just make an account here and then log in. And then once you're logged in, it's going to prompt you to select a cloud vendor as well as a region. I'm just gonna choose the one that's closest to me and click let's start free. So it's gonna take a bit of time to load up and once it's ready, you'll have the ability to connect to your database. So we'll just wait a couple of seconds for this to finish and then I'll show you how to actually set it up inside of your application. Okay, so it looks like it is done now. So we can click on connect here and it's gonna give us a few different ways to connect. We're gonna copy this URI here, starting with the Redis colon slash slash. We're gonna copy all of this and we are going to come into our application here and go into .env and we're going to say Redis URI. And I'm just gonna paste this here. And then the username by default is going to be default. And then we can get the password if we go into our databases and we click on this database here that we just created and we scroll down a bit, we should have the default user password. We can copy that and then paste that here. So now that we have that environment variable set, I'm gonna come into my lib directory here. I'm gonna create a new directory called server and a file called redis.ts. And we do install a couple libraries, one of which is going to be IO Redis, which is a robust performance focused and full featured Redis client for Node.js. There's a couple of different clients out there. This is the one that the Redis Cloud instance recommends that we install. So that's the one we're gonna use here. So I already have these installed, but you can go ahead and install these now. And then we'll come back into our redis.ts file and we'll say import Redis from IO Redis. And then we'll import the Redis URI from env static private. And then we'll say export const Redis equals new Redis. And we're just gonna pass in that Redis URI. And then we'll open up our load function here on the search page. And if we take a look at our diagram here, we can kind of get an idea as to what we need to do. So the first thing that we need to do when we receive a request is to check our Redis cache. 
to see if that exists. And Redis stores things in key value pairs. So the key is going to be whatever the search query is or the search term is. The value is gonna be the list of movies that's returned from the API. So the first thing we need to do is we need to check to see if something exists. So I'm gonna remove these console logs for the time being here. And we're gonna say const cached equals await Redis, which we need to import from lib server Redis dot get. And we're gonna pass in Q, which is that search term, right? So it's gonna look in the cache for a key that matches whatever the user searched for. And then we can say if cached, we're gonna console log cache hit just to demonstrate here. And we will return JSON dot parse cached because it's gonna store it as a string inside of Redis. And then if this doesn't get hit, then we're gonna say cache miss, and then we'll do the rest of these things as expected. So once we actually have these movies here, what we'll do is we'll say redis.set, we'll pass in the key. We have the key, right? Which is going to be the search term. And then when you do json.stringify movies.results. And then we can set an expiration by passing ex here with another comma and the expiration. In this case, I know that it's 600 seconds, right? So we can just pass in 600 here. And then in order to ensure that our cache control headers are lined up with the Redis expiration time, whenever we have a cache hit, what we can do is we can say const TTL equals await Redis dot TTL Q right? And this is going to give us back a number or undefined. So what we can do here is we can say set headers, cache control. We'll say max age equals, and we need to turn this into a template string here, TTL. And then we will return all that back to the client. Okay. So let's check this out now. So if I go here, let's clear everything out. Let me hard refresh this page so that I have a fresh page here. And actually in reality, I could also open up a new in private window as well. We'll use that in just a second. So I'm gonna open up my network tab and then I'm going to search for a movie and I'm gonna search for something like, I don't know, Harry Potter. Okay, we can see that that took 611 milliseconds total for this client here. When I go back, we know that it should be cast here, right? One millisecond disk cache. But when I go to my in private browser and I open up the network tab here and I search for Harry Potter, look how much faster that was. 84 milliseconds is all it took compared to the other one, which was 611 milliseconds. And there's a lot of Harry Potter stuff out there, I'm sure. But we can see there's a pretty dramatic difference there in time that it took to fetch that data. And it could be even faster if we weren't setting the TTL like this. If we just set like some other TTL here, or we didn't even pass a cache control really. If we just set this here, like so, and let me clear all this out and I'll do the same thing here as well. And I'll search for Lord of the Rings. We see that took 223 milliseconds. And then I come into my other browser and search for Lord of the Rings we'll see that that only took 42 milliseconds compared to the 358 milliseconds that it took to render it on this one. And that's because, again, referring back to our diagram here, that first request is the cache miss. So it's gonna take some more time because it has to make that API call and then return the data back to the client. Whereas the subsequent requests are all cache hits. Those go straight to the cache. It's in memory storage, super fast, super easy to set up. And then just to demonstrate that the cache is missing at first and then hitting on subsequent request, we get search for the wizard and we come into our console here of our application. We have a cache miss. And then if I open up a new in private window here and I search for wizard, you can see that it took 49 milliseconds. And if we look at our console here, we had a cache hit. So that's how easy it is to set up Redis. It's super easy, super cool. That speed increase definitely makes a big difference. So I hope this video has been informative for you. If you got value out of it, don't forget to like and subscribe. I greatly appreciate the support and I will see you all in the next video.